Hello and welcome to another edition of The Week That Really Was with John McGregor and Sarah Ryan for this week ending Friday the 2nd of August. It's the height of summer. Summer has finally arrived. The weather is good and Sarah's off to the Galway race. Are you looking forward to it, Sarah? Very much so. Very much so. I haven't been in years, so I can't wait. Have you any tips for the viewers? Absolutely not. uh, By the the time this goes out, actually, all the races are on the line. But you can still give the tips so we can see if you're any good. No, I give political tips, not horses. All right. Okay. Um, how was how did you enjoy uh, last week, which is obviously our first episode of talking to viewers directly and looking them in the eye? Did you enjoy the feedback and many, many comments about your beauty and grace? Yeah, I loved that. Um, well, I won't get into them specifically, but my brother and sister are also are very entertained by some of the negative ones. They're giving them loads of material. Um, yeah, it's a bit weird at the start, but I don't know. I'm fine with it now. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, look, it was. Uh, it's called the week that really was. We're recording it slightly early because of Sarah's racing commitments. But as of the time when we are recording it, there isn't really a lot to say. Not a lot's happened in Ireland. They've all gone on holidays and left us with a bit of peace and quiet. So the main stories this week, Sarah, it seems to me, have been kind of international. And I suppose the one we'll start with was shortly after our podcast went out last week. Obviously, we, we settled down to watch the Olympic opening ceremony, and um, it seemed to generate quite a bit of comment. What was your take on it? Well, I suppose my take with it, and I got, I, I tweeted about it and I got quite a bit of pushback from some people, um, but then a lot of people in agreement that I found it kind of offensive and not because I'm particularly religious, but just, I, 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 I mean, I suppose it boils down to this. Why does everything have to be about this new liberal cult stuff? Why mm. does everything have to be about this? It, it, it Trans people exist, okay, but let's put let's to make the sum simple. Let's say trans people are one percent of the population. Why is the trans thing a part of ninety percent of anything like this? And I just come from a positioning where position where, and I think in a country that had this entire horrific situation with Charlie Eb, just sweet Charlie, mm-hmm. like why? Don't you just leave the religion to the side? It doesn't mean I think it should be illegal to say anything bad about religions because I don't, because I believe in free speech. But I just think it's disrespectful to people's faith to make a mockery of it in any way. And you should just leave it all to the side. Um, And I I just, I'm baffled as to why somebody, and and I saw the the man who produced the entire um, ceremony being interviewed and he said he wanted to be inclusive. Well, inclusive of whom? Because it didn't seem to be very cl- inclusive of anybody with the Catholic faith from from my from where I was sitting, and I think that people were upset by it. I think they were entitled to be upset by it. I think they would never do something similar with any image from the Quran. And I think that can you not just have a ceremony like I saw split screens with other ones where there was dancing and so much beautiful cultural th- things that in France, you know, obviously at the end Celine Dion that was amazing. That's what you came up with. That's what you decided to do. Like, you know, women dressed up in drag, d- d- making a mockery of the Last Supper. Okay. Not my cup yeah. of tea. Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote about it during the week and I said, I said, like, the left basically has main character syndrome. Um, mm. Most people are familiar with main character syndrome. It's kind of a psychological delusion that the individual, whoever has that syndrome, is the, is the main character of the world. Like, the whole world is a movie and you're the main character. And I kind of feel like a lot of people on the political left have that. So that, like, the, the, the Olympics can't happen without them being there and being involved, because if they're not there and involved and represented, like, you know, it's just not legitimate. Um, so you have this this bizarre situation with the with the sort of the Last Supper tableau, we call it, which is the one that has generated the most controversy. Um, and it just struck me as 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 very calculated like yeah. whether you and, and, and the other thing i said is look it's a painting it's not a, it's not necessarily a religious icon it's not a crucifix it's a painting but you know and and they're parodying a painting so but it, it was it struck me as very conscious very deliberate very we will put this together knowing exactly what buttons it will push knowing exactly who it will offend and then we'll slap ourselves on the back afterwards and go ha, 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 ha. you know aren't they so annoyed um and there's just this hint of kind of deliberately being offensive about it. And that, I think, is where the Muslim comparison comes in, because sometimes I, I hear Christians saying, oh, you wouldn't mock the Muslims. And uh, and they never 
they never finished that thought, which is, are, are you saying Christians should be more like the Muslims? Should, 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 should we react the way they do sometimes when, when there are relatively minor offenses delivered against them? I hope that's not what you're saying. Um, but I, I do think it is more a, com a comment on the cowardice of art and the laziness of art and how lazy these people have gotten, where the most original thing they can come up with is actually not original at all. Um, mm. I mean, you know, who, who thought of who thought of ever taking a religious scene and replacing the people in it with um, drag queens? I mean, that's 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 groundbreaking. That's never been done before. Right. So on that, but on the other hand, I, did you not think some of the reaction? And I, I'm playing devil's advocate here, but I, I genuinely think this to some degree. Do you not think some of the reaction was a little bit over the top? I mean, I watched and rolled my eyes. Well, I think that it's because what you're saying as a standalone thing. If I go into um, Temple Bar and there's an art installation happening on the street, and that and this is being done there, well, then yeah, I, everything I've just said. I stand over that I don't know why you have to do that and I think it's offensive to people, whatever. But this is the opening ceremony of the Olympics. This is, the Olympics have, is athletes from across the world who all have different faiths, different creeds, whatever. And it's, a, it's, it's like, like other um, countries would normally use it to showcase their culture, showcase their country, showcase what they're about. So it's not, it's not just that it's offensive, but I don't think that the reactions were, were, um, over the top because the stage is so large. It's such a large view, like viewership. People around the world are watching. And, you know, it seems like, as you say, deliberately offensive to people. On not a, It's not a, an art installation on the street in town. It's not a, a, a comedy club that you went to. It's the opening ceremony, ceremony for France of the Olympics with a huge viewership. And you still wanted to do this. This is what you chose to do. Yeah, and I think I, that that's why people found it more offensive. Yeah. There were two other things about it, I thought. First of all, um, I know the athletes were there and I know they were sail sailing up the River Seine on their little boats and all the rest. So I kind of found it disrespectful to the athletes to make the opening mm -hmm. ceremony about basically anything but them. Um, so we had this yeah. ridiculous scene um, with a decapitated Marie Antoinette in the window. Um, which I just thought was, I mean, first of all, I, I thought the whole thing had this kind of misogynistic theme running through it because, I mean, you had obviously the drag queens and then you had Marie Antoinette being decapitated. I mean, there was no Robespierre there who who executed her and died a much worse death himself in the end. It was just the, ha, 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 we killed a relatively innocent, innocent woman 200 years ago. Aren't we great? Um, that rankled me really in a bad way. Um, but then, of course, you get the kind of sneering, Oh, well, well, why do you care? Why don't you just switch it off, et cetera, et cetera. And as you say, I think you hit on the answer to that, which is that people are tuning in to watch a sporting extravaganza. It's like the whole business of people kneeling down at the beginning of premiership football matches. Like yeah. you, you're not actually kneeling when you kneel down there. You're not, th those footballers aren't kneeling to stop racism. That might be what they're saying. They're kneeling because if they don't kneel, the mob will turn on them. They're actually kneeling to what is expected of them by the commentariat and those who dominate our culture and to avoid um, three weeks of headlines about why Marcus Rashford doesn't take a knee. Um, so it's all this kind of, it, it, it's, it's much more about the social pressure to recognize certain groups that is about art. Um, and I think calling it art, therefore, is a lie and a misnomer. Yeah, and I still think that it's being deliberately offensive for the reaction, for the clicks. You know, we're here. You, you know, and 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 just I, I I think that offending other people's religion is just not sound, and um I don't think that's the place for it. And as you say, it was less about the athletes, more about this dancing around. I don't get it. Not my cup of tea. And can I not just be? about the sport you know i mean well speaking of the sport um we did we have won one gold medal now so mm -hmm. that's that's good going but uh, i have to say i'm not a big olympics fan i just kind of feel like it's two weeks every four years where we watch sports that we never watch at any other time uh, does that make me I a know. Bridge? no i i think i always think i loved i love watching people win because i know that you know, um, any sport, but like in, as you know, in my family, I have a professional athlete and, and, you know, he, I know the work that goes into becoming a professional athlete. And so when you see people win, even if it's in a random sport, you don't understand. It's so nice, you know, so like, I, mm. I find that I don't get emotional about a lot of things, but I find 
watching people, you know, achieve something they really wanted to achieve is amazing and like I'm delighted for them. But there's certainly sports that I I don't even I you know, as you say, you would never watch. But yeah, I admire the graft, you know, the graft yeah. that it takes to commit yourself to something, you know, like work at it and work at it, work at it and get to that level. Amazing. All right, well, look, we, we've discussed the Olympic opening ceremony as much as I think we can. I don't know if there's much more to say to, except to note that I think I think it did backfire. I think there was an mm-hmm. awful lot more opposition to it than they perhaps expected, which I think is in keeping with this broader cultural shift across the West where people are just sick of this shit, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I think they probably, I mean, I, I was thinking back, I was trying to remember London 2012, where the opening ceremony was basically an homage to the saintly NHS. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, and there was some muted criticism for how woke that was at the time, but nothing like this. And I think, oh. the, the, I think the reaction is kind of indicative of how the you know, people are kind of increasingly sick of it now. Yeah, um, and some of the um, some of the I've noticed as well online some of the boxing, you know, the um, the allowance of um, different people into the ring and the boxing has um, inf- inflamed the internet as well. I don't know. We might be at a corner. Yeah, but I don't think that's necessarily um, fair. Some of that because I I know obviously the athletes in question are potentially biologically male but I, I don't think it's a case that they're letting transgender people in i think these are the one in 300 one in 400 thousand births of people who actually are born with the wrong genitalia or, or chromosomal disorder or whatever uh, much like the case of castor semenya of course who was a famous south african runner who i think only discovered that he was a man after dna testing or something like that after he competed and won an olympic medal um so it's not as I do feel some sympathy with those athletes. I'm not saying they should be allowed to be allowed to compete, but I think it's a very different situation than, you know, somebody who was born Fred Flintstone fighting as Wilma. You know, I think there's a there's a slight difference there. But there will that will be the basis that will be used upon justifying it in the future because yeah. you know that 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 syndrome is used as the demonstration of the fact that people can be born in the wrong body. So that will be used as the basis. And there has been fights where trans men are fighting women. Oh, they have, but I, I just don't think it's happening in these Olympics uh, necessarily. But yeah, look, there's an issue. There is an issue there, and it's an issue they're going to have to clean up because essentially it's the same essential problem, which are these people are biologically male. Yeah. Um, and they're fighting in women's sports, which obviously shouldn't be permitted. Anyway, we'll move on because obviously it was a week of major tragedy across the water in the UK with what happened in Southport. Um. It really kind of was a repeat of what happened on Parnell Street, I think, except with, with much worse consequences this time, wasn't it? A very similar situation where somebody is just seems to have targeted children. What do you think is the phenomenon there? Just talking to Jason Osborne this week about it. Jason obviously writes for Grips and is a, 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 somebody who thinks deeply about the world and he was saying he thought there was there was a theological article to be written out about why is it that the modern world seems to have a particular loathing of children. And he was drawing various examples of the, the, the kind of disproportionate suffering inflicted on children in Gaza, for example, the yeah. the, 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 the in, in eastern Ukraine, you see there have been allegations that the Russians have been taking and abducting children there to adopt them in depopulated parts of Russia, unproven allegations, allegations. You've got, I mean, you've got obviously the the Hugh Edwards case, which is broken just as we're recording this of, you know, whereas one of the most respected news readers in the world was, has just pleaded guilty to making images that are pornographic of children. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very strange thing. I don't think you attack children because you have a problem with children. I think I think children are a symbol, are they not, of the society that you live in? Um, you're you're literally attacking a society's future. You're trying to, you know. I remember when uh, years ago I used to live in a housing state. Um, the, the most antisocial little shits living around the place would wait until the spring when the daffodils bloomed, and they go around with hurleys destroying them. And I, I thought that was kind of like peak antisocial behavior because you're destroying something that's new you're destroying it's growing you're destroying its beauty it's really it's really a two fingers to the community that you live in it's like yeah. we're going to take away take away something that that is valuable and precious except obviously yeah. in the case of children on a, on a degree that is 100 million times more extreme so yeah. um 
That, I, I mean, I'm no psychiatrist, but I, I'm guessing that's what it's about, which, 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 which opens up a broader debate because I think one of the things that happens is, like, in the West now, I saw Nigel Farage today, uh, and today being Wednesday, we're recording this, as I said earlier, a little earlier this week, but I saw Nigel Farage today saying that, you know, he thinks that, the, that there might be being information kept from us, which is... On the one hand, I know what he's saying. On the other hand, I think it's a terrible thing to say because I mean, it's an unquestion, it's an unanswerable question. I mean, if you go to the government and say, "What are you keeping from us?" and they say nothing, I mean, how many people are going to believe that if they're if they're buying into Nigel Farage's question? So it's an unfair question. But I also know yeah. where he's coming from because I feel like every time one of these things happens now. I mean, last week there was an incident in the, in in London of a soldier being attacked in the middle of the day. Mental health incident. This a mental health incident. What happened in Dublin in Parnell Street? An absolute copycat of this, by the way, except with less lethal consequences. A mental health incident. Um, in all cases, kind of like a, a real hesitancy to talk about the perpetrator. A real hesitancy. Um, lest it stoke the wrong kind of opinion about what's happening in society. I mean, the, I mean, this is a pattern now, and I think there's a very clear pattern um, in these cases where the reaction of the people managing this society is to manage the rest of us, to manage our reactions in case we go stone mad. And the problem is now that that managing of reactions is no longer working because people in Southport on Tuesday night went stone mad, and people in Parnell Street the day after what happened there or the night after what happened there, weren't stone mad, um, to 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 use a phrase. So yeah, I I, I just think it's um, there's a big conversation here that we're not having. I'm just not sure what that conversation is. Part of it is immigration for sure. It's not only immigration though. Yeah, uh, I mean, look, these kind of things are just uh, particularly because I have small kids, so terrifying. The idea of it, the chaos of it, I can just, like, to be honest, I, I kind of try not to think about it too much because it's so scary. And I think that it it inflames, you know, a, a tight people and, and enrages people on another level. So it's it gets such a reaction. In this case, it seems to me from so far that this is a uh, 17-year-old, is that correct? Yeah. So, I mean, like... Again, and and the thing is, as you say, like if if things are being kept from us, everything could be kept from us. Not you know, we could know nothing about it. So, uh, I don't I don't really know what the answer is, but I think what it's demonstrating is that there is a simmering rage underneath in society about immigration and about a whole a whole section of things, and that when something like this happens, those people immediately assume that it's something that it may or may not be because they're so enraged. So if you know, like the communities with Kulak who of Kulak who have not been, um, you know, spoken to or communicated with about anything that's going on there. If something awful was to happen in Kulak, when if that center was opened, there'd be a there'd be a crowd of people who would assume that it was because of that, even if they're wrong. And so when you when you let tempers get so hot that there's just like one triggering event can cause rioting and whatever. You, you know, it, it's a demonstration that the that the society is sick, uh, mm. and I think that this is obviously this person is sick, and this uh, this event is just horrifying beyond measure. But it's also showing up a sickness in society that's happening there, it's happening here, it's happening across the world. And you know, we're 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 a podcast based in Ireland, so we're predominantly interested in Irish, the Irish situation, and I think that. You know, if something like that happens here, God forbid, you know, the reaction would be blame and the government would probably, you know, try to manage the information such that because they didn't want people to get too excited. Yeah. But you can't and do we, that. We we have on record comments from people like Kitty Holland say, basically saying it is the media's job to manage public opinion as well. And obviously, I, I, mm. I fundamentally disagree with that. But it's like you're not a crisis manager for the government if you're a journalist. And I think a lot of journalists in the West, because they're broadly progressive, because they broadly subscribe to a particular school of thought in relation to, you know, race and equality and immigration and all those issues, see their job to be a crisis manager for the government when these things arise. Now, the other thing about, for, that was interesting for me about this, and I mean, th we are purely speculating here because all we know about the perpetrator is his age, and the rawest details of his nationality, which is that he appears to have been born in Cardiff in Wales to parents who arrived from Rwanda. And 
I mean, it just strikes me that if you look at Belgium and you look at France and you look at the pattern across, across Europe of sort of radicalization as a result of immigration, it's nearly always in the second generation. It's nearly mm -hmm. always people who were born into the French society or the Belgian society, um, the children of migrants who for some reason or other, because of the integration policies that have been pursued, which don't really integrate people at all, grow up feeling a sense of loathing and resentment and hatred towards the very society that gave their parents shelter. Um, and there's been, you know, it, it tends to be these most extreme incidents, and this is a generalization, but there's a pattern where they tend to involve people who've been around either their second generation people or people who've been here for 30 years, maybe. Um, and I think there's real questions to be asked about that as well, because one of the things about immigration policy that we're constantly told is that this is the compassionate thing to do, that we're good, you know, that we're shunting people into, yeah. into asylum centers. And, and this is this is the good side. And he was saying, don't do it. They're the bad side. But I wonder what the consequences are to bringing a load of people to your country whose formative experience of it is that they were shunted into a disused factory in Gulag. Um, I wonder how how successful that is, how good that is, or how healthy that is for society in the longer term, when people who arrive here at the hands of a state that invites them in are then treated like garbage to be disposed of in any old town or village across the countryside. Um, because I think it was the experience in Belgium and France, that people felt ghettoized, that their children grew up feeling alienated, and with a disproportionate number of these instances. Now, that might not be what happened in Southport, might not be. But it just struck mm. me that the profile, child of migrants, about 17, clearly feeling alienated from his society, it fits that pattern. Yeah. I mean, like you say, we don't know yet, but I think that one of the issues that I have with the Irish government and how they're managing immigration in general is, as you say, like we're, you know, we're quite behind other countries like the UK in terms of, you know, the immigration. Immigration is relatively new generationally to us compared to the UK and France and other countries. And I think that one of the frustrations I have with the Irish government is that they don't seem to learn any lessons from any mistakes that have been made in other countries vis-a-vis -vis integration or how it's managed. We just go along and do the exact same thing that was done before. It didn't always work. Um, it didn't work to integrate people. It didn't work to, you know, eradicate racism but you know like help racism not get out of hand etc cetera, etc cetera, in lots of parts of the UK uh, and across Europe and instead of, of kind of sitting down and really looking at that and thinking about well how could this be done better we'll just throw a load of lads into an old paint factory and hope that they won't yeah. be annoyed at us in a few years that we treated them badly okay yeah if that, you know Conor Fitzgerald has been on this show and is a friend of the show and writes an excellent sort of stack that people should read called the fit stack look it up and wrote a piece this week just about that where he said look basically you know ireland is doomed to suffer the consequences of continental immigration policies because there's there's no imagination here to a recognize that we're on the same trajectory b do anything about it and c even if there was it's probably too late to do anything about it now and it was a very depressing read but it was very prescient in that he said look irish politicians are only interested in one thing, uh, which is surviving the, to next week. And they will yeah. be looking, Irish politicians will be looking at the the Irish Times uh, snapshot opinion poll that was published this week that showed immigration falling from the top concern down to the second top concern behind housing. And they will be looking at that and going, it's working. Our plan is working. This issue is going away. Hooray. Yeah. Um, but it's not. It's not. No. It's just not a salient right now at the moment. But like every everywhere I go around the country, this is the this is really the only political issue that's mentioned to me. That somebody at my house the other day doing a little bit of work who had never met before in my life who happened to recognize me it was the first thing he said was about the the immigration issue and how you can't say anything about it these days or whatever. And I said, well, you can. Um, but like it's it's just on people's tongues um, still, um, and the government has no no real objective other than just getting to the end of next week. So yeah, it's all yeah. very depressing, isn't it? Uh, and I think the government also has the strategic objective of keeping this to the minimum conversation, or keeping this as much out of the conversation as possible until the general election is over. Because yeah, and I they're think helped, it can... by the way. They're they're helped by a conversation that's so polarized. Like they are, helped. I mean, the government's biggest allies on this issue, and this is where I, you know, I, I, I'm fond of getting in trouble with the listeners and fond of getting in trouble with my readers. But the government's biggest allies on this issue are people who can't talk about it reasonably, people who can't discuss this issue without shouting about plantations or deport them all or mass deportations now or Ireland for the Irish 
or whatever, who are a perfect foil for the government because it just sends most reasonable people running for cover. And if you don't mm. believe me, look at the last local European election results. Um, they, they vast bulk of people in the centre of the country did not run on this issue to the people who are shouting loudest about it. And until such time as there is, um, there are people who are able to have this debate um, using calm language that appeals to the middle ground and says, you know, the government is clearly incompetent and out of its depth, then the situation is going to persist uh, because you're not going to get the current political class out of power by um, going around waving tricolors. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so I, I, I feel like we know that there's, there's, there's no not going to be any let up in the amount of people who are arriving here. There's not going to be any any significant change in the housing stock that's available to them. I think the government have kind of said that as well as the paint, old paint factory in Kulak, there's going to be at least thirty more of these. I think they'll just yeah. be a, so they'll just be a slow conversation about that up until the general election, and then once the general election has happened, it'll be mm. you know. And but uh, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, and I was saying, well. If you want to vote for people who are telling you what they're going to do, don't be upset about it later. Yeah, I mean that, that that's the other element of it too. But we voters, this is a democracy. Voters make their choice, and they will have a, an opportunity yeah. to make a choice on that in a few months' time. Anyway, look, we'll have loads of politics to talk about um, once the the Rockers comes back in somewhere. I want to talk a little bit about uh, Damien O'Brien, who died um, at the beginning of the week. Um, obviously, somebody who was a very influential novelist in her own way. But did you see the Twitter thread I posted during the week about all the claims that were made about how her books were burnt in Ireland in the 1960s? Yeah, go on. So basically, um, for those who don't know Edna O'Brien, I, I suspect there are a few watching this, but so she 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 left Ireland as a, as a young woman. She wrote her first book in her late 20s. And it was a depiction of her growing up uh, or a character very much based on herself herself growing up in County Clare in 1950s Ireland. And it was the first book, uh, you know, ever written by an Irish author since independence, really, to have had slightly erotic overtones in it. And when I say slightly erotic, having read it, I mean, this is, we're talking very mild stuff. I think there were like two yeah. explicitly sexual references in the whole book. But basically, y your woman was, the, the main character was a little bit randy. Anyway, for this... The book was banned by the Irish Censorship Board. Um, Charlie Hawhey and uh, or Ch Charlie Hawhey, I think, described it as filth that had no place in any decent home. And um, Archbishop McQuaid made similar comments, and it was banned. However, um, in the weeks since she's died, there have been various stories during the rounds, including in the Guardian, uh, the New Statesman. Most of the international media has has repeated this tale that her books were actually gathered up in her hometown by the local parish priest and set alight on fire. Um, which simply isn't true. Um, that didn't happen. And in fact, the reason we know it didn't happen is because the Irish Times initially reported that rumour in 1965 and then went back in 1966 and looked into it and said, no, this definitely didn't happen. But yet and all, I just thought it was interesting that this kind of exaggeration and embellishment of what happened, because what, what actually yeah. happened to her was bad enough. But this embellishment yeah. is so widely believed and so widely circulated, even though it didn't happen at all. And the willingness we have, or the media that talks so much about fact-checking and fake news and misinformation, has to just run with a fake story when that fake story, um, you know, pr promotes a certain narrative. I mean, we've talked about this a lot, but this is just another example of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not particularly familiar with, I, I certainly haven't read that book, but yeah, it, it, it's great. It's a great yarn. It's it's women were put upon, were so badly treated, everything, you know, it's exaggerating because it fits the narrative. You know, it's like you were saying earlier on about the the um, immigration and stuff that the media won't, you know, they, they, they don't report it. Kitty Holland thinks it's their job to, you know, keep information that they don't think the public will react well to, um, to themselves. So I, I, I think that they're inclined not to, they're inclined not to um, publish information that goes against the truth that they have about, you know, what kind of society we are. And they are inclined to exaggerate information that upholds the 
truth they have about what it you know used to be like to live in Ireland and that's not to say that there wasn't you know massive culture wars and and you know problems in Irish society for women and writers and etc 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 but it's just that like let you know don't let the truth get in the way of a good story especially when that story makes our narrative about Ireland stronger Mm -hmm. yeah and I mean look I, I do think that whole sort of how bad was 1950s Catholic Ireland thing gets exaggerated constantly. So, for example, I remember reading an article a couple of years ago about how, like, you know, a, a young Irish woman who got pregnant outside of marriage would be denounced from the altar the following Sunday. And that simply, that that didn't happen. That That's not a thing that happened in this country. The priests did not do that. They did not single out young Kitty O'Shea and say, you have brought shame upon your family and your community and get thee from this church. That didn't happen. Now, it was brutal enough. What did happen was often often, but it was often awful, but it was imposed by and large by families other than the, mm-hmm. the institution of the church, which I'm not trying to defend, by the way. But I just think yeah. that we have this myth-making about sort of like how, I mean, there, there's a generation of young people, and I've come across some of them, I, I think, I, you know, the Zoomer generation, who've come through Irish education and, and seem to genuinely believe the kind of 1950s and 1960s Ireland was a Gilead, like on a par with the Spanish Inquisition, you know, where, mm. where and I, I think that's been deliberately stoked and it's it's brutal because I think it, it, I would recommend people to re- read Edna O'Brien's books because I think they actually depict what it was like, which was mm. kind of gossipy and and you know valley of the squinting windowsy and you know a feeling of very being very claustrophobic um that's how it comes across in her book it doesn't come across in any way as a kind of a i mean this is she 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 writes about two young women who live quite you know um licentious lives for for the period in dublin and london and there's they aren't packed off to a convent or a nunnery or anything like that i mean so it's so it's it's actually it's actually worth reading the books because she depicts it as it was, not as we imagine it might have been. Yeah, I think there's some there's a kind of a um, a thesis in this, but you know, I think that as a society, as a modern society, like young people, like it's it, and, and old, it's 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 great to blame the church on every single bad thing that happened in Ireland, as you say, and and this isn't to defend the church or say that the church didn't do lots of very bad things, but families threw their daughters out when they were pregnant and disowned them. Families disowned people for being gay. You know, there was sexual abuse within the church of children. Sexual abuse within families was also rampant. And I think there's some kind of thesis there when you're a sort of a post-colonial society. It's like, you know, there's always the other and it's easier to blame the church. Everything that was ever wrong in Ireland up until we all got enlightened by Kitty Holland was the church's fault. And it Mm -hmm. still is, because that means that we never have to say, well, maybe as a society, we were quite cruel to each other back then, Mm -hmm. because, you know, that's harder conversation to have. It's harder conversation to say your great granny was kind of a wagon and kind of cruel than it is to say, oh, well, it was always the church, the church, the church, the church. And again, not to say the church didn't make huge, massive mistakes and do awful things, but we did pretty awful stuff to each other. And we still have a culture of you know, the outsider, the twitching windows, the topics are different, but the culture is the same. You're one of them or you're one of us. And, you know, it's easier to blame other than it is to take accountability for your own actions, your own cruelty, the way you behaved and how a lot of people in Ireland take, you know, regardless of the church, were lemmings who followed around along without a mind of their own and allowed their daughters or their sons or their granddaughters or their grandchildren to be thrown into laundries and cast out of society. Now, take ownership of that you know like we have to take ownership of that and we don't because we have the big bad church to blame all the time and kitty holland to tell us that it's not our fault yeah i think the other thing that there is to blame which is a conversation that no one wants to have i mean nobody wants to have this conversation but but i think there's a degree to which um and i'll be be very careful i want people to pay attention to the word i use nationalism uh Mm. played a role and and I, i i say that not to condemn today's nationalism, nationalists or to say that nationalism in and of itself is always wrong or always bad. But Irish nationalism in the period was a kind of particular kind of, okay, we've achieved independence and our image of Ireland is as kind of a, a Garden of Eden, you know, set aside from the sins and corruptions of the world largely inflicted by the Brits. So mm-hmm. kind of like the, the, this sense that 
Ireland was was always a different place, and we would resist kind of enlightened, enli- more enlightened liberal ideas at the time because they weren't Irish. Not necessarily that they weren't Catholic, but it all comes back to this dancing at the crossroads idea and the lovely, innocent, naive Irish Colleen and all that sort of stuff. And I do think there was a sense to which um, there's that old line about how there was no sex in Ireland before the Late Late Show and somebody else retorted to it, that's because sex is a British idea. Um, <laughs> At the time, and and and, and there, there, was, there was a there was a there was a tendency. I think there was a, I I can hear me, Irene, my colleague, who's probably listening to this. I can hear her punching the headphones as I talk. But I think there's a degree to which that kind of very insular nationalism, which was also seen with sort of things like the trade war with Britain and so on and so forth, played a very large role in kind of stunting the emotional development of the nation um, on on some of these issues. And I say that as a conservative, by the way. But you know, that's that's what I think. Yeah, well, maybe I'm totally still... wrong. Fight with me in the comments. <laughs> Fight with me in the comments. Um, but conservatives, cons- you know, you can you can reflect. I mean, this is the, this is the essence of you know the the problem with the culture wars is that you can be critical of your own side, you know, and no, say, you "Here's how." That's not allowed. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I trust me, I do it regularly. No, not allowed. Traitor! You're a traitor. Um, but yeah, I think that there's there's an interesting conversation there that's worth having but that's too scary to have and so therefore we as a society probably won't have because we have the body we found who we found who done it so we don't have to reflect on our own cruelty yep speaking of uh baddies and who done it uh we won't get into who done it in lebanon and the latest rows between israel and hamas and hezbollah and all the rest of it but mm. um what are our troops still doing there? I wrote a piece about this on Monday. I don't know if you read it, saying, look, it, it, it seems readily apparent that there's a real risk of escalation there and we've got a bunch of Irish soldiers sitting in the middle of two sites firing rockets over each other's heads. I mean, are those lads actually going to be deployed to stop a war or should we not just bring them home now? Uh, I mean, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think if it was my relative, I'd want them to come home. But what's their impact going to be, to be fair? Um... I think my my um my mother's father, so my grandfather, but he died when my mum was um eleven, so I never met him. Obviously, he was in the army and he was deployed in multiple places around the world. And um, I think that for families who have somebody there, the impact that they're going to make is probably quite minimal. So I would want them to come home, but I'm not. I'm not. Um, I mean, I think we always try and have our cake and eat it when it comes to stuff like that. We want to go in peace. We want to have an army, but we don't want to pay them. We want to have peacekeeping missions, but we don't want to be involved in fighting. It's like, okay, what do we want? What's the point of this? Yeah, well, that's, that, that's my question is, what is the point? Because um, for those who didn't read my piece, which I imagine is quite a few people watching this, like Unifil, which is the mission we're there on, it's called the, you know, people say Irish so- troops on the Unifil mission in Lebanon. The Unifil mission UNIFIL stands for United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon. Um, it's been going on now for 48 years. So we, we've been there for half a century on an interim mission that had three three objectives. First of all, to keep Israeli troops out of southern Lebanon, which it has failed to do on a number of occasions. Second of all, to, to maintain international peace and security, which it hasn't done at all. And third, to restore the authority of the Lebanese government over South Lebanon. Those are the three mission objectives of the UNIFIL mission. None of them have been accomplished. I mean, South Lebanon is governed by Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization. So, and, and I don't see Irish troops or their their international colleagues from France, Niger, and other countries, um, you know, going out to clear Hezbollah out of the place and, and fulfill their mandate to restore Lebanese authority over the southern half of their country. So, what are they doing there? What what is the? Agenda? I mean, I would actually love to hear an Irish government minister address this openly. Like, what is the current military objective of our soldiers in Lebanon? What what good are they doing? What is, are they accomplishing that would not be accomplished where they brought home? And I kind of think it's one of those things where um, it comes back, to, I think, to nationalism. There's a degree of national pride about our fact that our soldiers are serving as peacekeepers, which there should yeah. be. I'm not, yeah. I'm not denying that. I mean, and, and I'm not denying the individual bravery of those soldiers who are out there doing, yeah. um, you know, risking their lives. And, and 48 Irish soldiers, I think, have lost their lives in that mission. And, you know, all of them died with honor. But what are they doing there? What, what what are they actually accomplishing? And if the answer to that question can't be answered in a couple of sentences, then I think bring them home, especially with the real prospect of a hot war looming. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, but you won't get a minister talking, like answering that because there is no answer to that. 
Yeah. I, I, I think it's I think it's I think it's a peacekeeping mission is, you know, an honorable thing. But I think when as you say, when it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter, it's time to, you know, really question what the value is there. Yeah. Well are you, not, it's, 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 yeah. I think the literal test is it's a peacekeeping mission. What are what are the Irish troops in Lebanon doing to keep the peace? What are they actually doing to keep the peace? What what actions are they taking? The answer is nothing. Because there's nothing they can do. If the Israelis and the, and the Hezbollah want to start hopping lumps off each other, which they've been doing with tragic um, tragic results for people, both in, in, in the Golan Heights and in southern Lebanon, nothing the Irish troops can do. They don't have the weaponry to intercept missiles from either side. So they can't keep the peace. So what are they doing there? That, anyway, maybe I'm uh, may, maybe I'm just a crank. But I, I really think, given the likelihood of a hot war, that it is prudent to really be asking the question of whether they should come home. I think they should. Yeah. Anyway. Well, no one's going to answer that for you. No. Trust me. No, they're not. They're not. Anyway, speaking of other controversial opinions, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about just something that was in the courts this week. The um, the the conviction of five members of his own family for the murder of Thomas Dooley in the graveyard in Kerry at a funeral. Um, do you think it is time to revisit Brenda Power's article that she was once prosecuted for or attempted to be prosecuted for about traveller culture? Or is this just a one-off? <sighs> really aren't the unit there. I'm conscious of that. But... Yes. I think I've always thought that we are so frightened and reluctant to have conversations about elements of traveller culture that we never have anything. We never talk about it at all. Um, I think that I don't think well, obviously like the specifics of this are a one off, but I think that there is an element of traveler culture that can be quite violent. Um, there, you know, there's a there's a I don't know if you're on TikTok, but there's a kind of a chain of videos that can sometimes come up in your algorithm of people calling each other out and fight, arranging to fight and meet. So there's general like quite a violent element to the culture for some travelers. Um. But my what I think is that we're so afraid of our lives to have any conversations about any elements of traveler culture that we just never have any at all. And, you know, we 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 fund NGOs to help and we tell ourselves that we're wonderful, but we don't have conversations about, you know, like the for as a woman, for example, the levels of education that women tend to reach. Um, they usually I think statistically they kind of max out at around 16. Um they get married very young. They have children very young. And is that the best option for girls? Some Sometimes it will be, but not for all of them. So I think that like having conversations about the elements of their culture that, you know, might not be, that might, could be better is people are terrified. Um, and, you know, we just keep paying for NGOs to help, but, you know, nothing changes. Well, it doesn't change because the NGOs don't address the problem, I don't think. I mean, I, th I was stuck by the Dooley case in that it, it really was kind of emblematic of a lot, a lot of the problems all wrapped up in one. I mean, the the, the, the case is this was a family feud, which is, mm. seems to be fairly, fairly strong, fairly frequent in traveller communities, yeah. uh, that turned violent on the basis that one person's daughter refused to marry another person's son, who was also their cousin. So it was an arranged cousin marriage, which resulted in a family feud because the daughter said no, for which her father was killed because in that culture or that particular family's interpretation of that culture, the, the daughter actually had no right to say no. Her father was her steward or master or owner, whatever language you want to use. And he had he had an obligation to make her marry her cousin. And because he didn't, he was the victim of a stabbing in a community. Now, that kind of thinking, and, and I'm, I'm separating this from, from wider issues of travel or culture, but that kind of thinking is medieval and barbaric. So where does it come from? You don't find it, by and large, in the rest of Irish society. You don't find it culture. Being, there is no Kerryman culture where this is the case. There's no Cavan culture. Um, you don't find it in Leitrim. You only tend to find this stuff in one particular segment of the community, which strongly suggests, I would argue, Sarah, that it is cultural, that it's that it's that it's cultural. Um, and I, I think the wider discussion here is we fund all these NGOs, the likes of the Pave Point and the Irish Traveller Movement, to address deprivation and discrimination within the traveller within the traveller community. But a lot of that deprivation and discrimination is a direct result of cultural backwardness. 
So you talk about education for kids. I mean, there, there is you you if you're a, a child in primary school and you're being moved from primary school to primary school every eight nine months as your family traverses around the country or maybe over to the UK and back, then that is obviously going to put you at an educational disadvantage compared to other people in society as a direct result of your culture and your way of life. Yeah. Um, and, and I just think we, you know, all the money we spend on this stuff to to attempt to preserve a culture that actively in many place in many cases the preservation of that culture puts the people within it at a severe disadvantage relative to the rest of society by virtue of their culture so um mm -hmm. yeah i think we have it backwards i mean there was a very controversial proposal in the 50s or 60s i can't remember exactly when which was basically like we should forcibly settle travers uh, and get rid of their culture it was it was i, I think you you would call it in in fairness it genuinely could be called perhaps an attempt at cultural genocide and i'm not saying we should go that far. But I, I, I think there really has to be, you know, there has to be a societal message that comes from the very top that says there are elements in your culture that we don't tolerate. And by the way, we already do that because we do that with other cultures as well. We do not tolerate in this society female gen genital mut mutilation. It's a crime, even yeah. though it's a cultural imperative for people for people from various communities, tribes, and ethnic backgrounds to come here. We still say, no, that's a, that's a crime. There are certain forms of ritual animal slaughter, for example, that we also not tolerate, even though they're cultural. So... So you know, I, I, I think there's um, there's a conversation to be had, frankly, that we're just not having. Yeah, I mean, I think if 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 we heard of a story of a girl, you know, in another country, perhaps a Muslim country, where she was didn't want to marry somebody because he was her cousin and her father was killed or whatever, everybody would be up in arms and horrified by that story and how horrifying and and you know that poor girl and you know there'll be a lot of pearl clutching and whatever. But when it's happening in Ireland in a in, in a protected class of people who nobody, everybody's afraid to to, to call out, everybody, the, you know, the, the talking heads just hide under the bed and pretend it's not happening. Yeah. Um, and, and in recent years, we've gone down this road. I mean, we, we recognised a separate and distinct traveller ethnicity. I, I'm not entirely sure. I'd love to know what exact what what benefits did that confer? I mean, loads of NGO money was spent, taxpayers' money given to NGOs to campaign to recognise travellers as a separate and distinct ethnicity. Okay, it's been in place now for several years. Can anyone point to one single benefit of having done that? How can anyone point to improved educational outcomes, a reduction in the norm? I mean, traveller men I think represent 0.7 percent of the population, but 10 percent of the prison population. Traveller women make up 15 percent of the prisoner population in this country. Some of that I don't doubt is down to deprivation, but some of that deprivation in turn is down to culture. So I mean, where, you know, where do you where do you begin to have a conversation about you know for all this for 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 even the time basically we demanded some results from the NGOs we're funding in this area yeah. to actually have measurable outcomes that are positively affecting people rather than just constantly campaigning for more money. And I mean, people forget when Brenda Power wrote her piece in the mail, in I think it was 2013, and she was very harsh. She said a lot of the things I just said in more harsh language. Um, she said traveler men are disproportionately violent, which I think is true. Um, she said they're disproportionately drunk. Uh, she said some of them are disproportionately lazy. She said lots of, lots of things like that. The, you know, the Traveller NGOs led a call for her to be prosecuted. The DPP opened a file for incitement to hatred. And when, when they decided that it was free speech and they couldn't prosecute her, the Irish um, Civil Liberties Council said, well, that's terrible. We need more hate speech laws. And that really was the germination of what we've seen over the last year or so here. So... So That's it's all Brenda's fault. We should we should let her know that it's her fault that we're going to have free Brenda speech. Know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we'll bring her on the show and hold her to a cut. Um, yeah. All right. I think we I think we we'll leave it there for another week. Um, it's been great to see you. Yeah. Um, and enjoy Me the too. races. And, I will. Um, hopefully next week we'll be we'll have more news on the domestic front. But I should warn viewers: we're heading into what all of those those who write about politics and current current affairs for a living dread, which is August. Because nothing happens, everyone goes on holiday and news kind of switches off. So uh, we'll find something to talk about next week when we're back uh, with you again. But until then, and also we'll um, one more thing, actually, just um, we got a, I got a few comments from people and DMs and stuff about my uh, talking about Kamala Harris, and we were talking about Kamala Harris and how you hate I hate that her sex life is being brought into it or whatever. So um, a lot of people came in, came at, not not in a bad way, just like said that I should reflect on the fact that the character of somebody who would sleep their way into jobs and accept things like that um it doesn't show her in good character or whatever so um noted 
noticed. Well, I disagree. I disagree with those commentators. Because first of all, they're making the assumption that that's what happened. So they're making an assumption that every woman in the workplace who has a relationship with a colleague or a superior well, is, is, is sleeping the rest of the time. But that, that assumption never made about men. Some, some lad who no. binds his secretary isn't thought to be doing it for, for advancement or binds his boss if she happens to be a female. No, like, like, but in so, this so situation, she was given in this situation, she was given a, a paid state position by someone she was sleeping with and a car. And that person was later investigated for the crime of giving positions and, you know, state money, state funded gifts to people. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's a case of, you know, I think that there's this person supported her. This person financed her or gave her two pa- paid jobs. Um, through his position so I think that that's what they're getting at that that shows a a, a kind of a it's not the generic you slept with your boss so those actual outcomes for her that started her career and that would be their argument yeah I don't buy it I don't I I don't really buy it um, to be honest with you because I mean that you know that implies a sort of malice and forethought where you know I'm sure that does happen in some situations of course it does of course there are people out there who do that but i think i think when it's when it's the when it's the first thing you reach for when it's the first explanation you reach for for somebody's rise when they're a woman oh they 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 set their way to the top or they had a relationship with this person and then they advanced clearly clearly this was transactional um i think that's inherently uh, you know I, i'm often accused of sexism wrongly but i think that is actually inherently sexist because i don't think it is i don't think it is said about men um, and I don't think that is the first suspicion that falls on a man. Men are subject, I should say, to their own entirely negative set of stereotypes that, you know, they're only after one thing and that if a, a man, for example, is mentoring a younger female colleague, that that's inherently suspicious, et cetera, et cetera. So men are subject yeah. to their own set of unfair stereotypes. But I think, I think, I think women are too. And just because Kamala Harris is one of the most annoyingly, infuriatingly dopey liberal women I've ever seen, uh, doesn't mean that she deserves that kind of treatment um, no i mean i still think it should be i think i still think it's off the the i still don't like it but i just got more comments than i would normally get about anything i say about that so i thought i would say it um because i like people to know that we actually do read the comments and yeah, we do. think we about do. it i cry even the bad ones you're mean about <laughs> um <sighs> Anyway, no, we do appreciate the comments. We appreciate that most of them are, are are very well intentioned, and I actually genuinely we appreciate the mean ones too, because yeah. it's only you know if you're genuinely angry with us about something, tell us. But this is a this is as far as we can make it a sort of two way conversation between Sarah and I and and you the the listeners. So uh, we appreciate the feedback, uh, and we appreciate that so many of you are taking part in the conversation as well because our our, our yeah. listenership figures are are really thrilling so thank you so much and now i will finally say that that was the week that really was and we'll see you all next week thanks so much for watching i've been i've been john she's been sarah and this has been the week that really was bye bye